recording on this computer. Hello and welcome, Professor Ivan Brown. I'm so happy to have you here with me and I'm honored indeed uh, that you have agreed and that you made the time to chat with me today. Um, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Great. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for, for inviting me, really. Um, so first of all, uh, yeah, I'm Ivan Brown. Um, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, um, brought up in the church, really important, active in the church, very much active in the sort of church planting and that kind of thing. But my other side of it is that I'm also Director of Public Health here at Leicester, and I'm also uh, an honorary professor of public health practice within one of our local universities uh, and, and sit on various national, national bodies. Thank you so much and welcome again. Um, so happy Freedom Day. Um, this, this video today is recorded on the proverbial Freedom Day. And I don't know, what does Freedom Day mean to you? Does it fill you with joy? Does it fill you with dread? Maybe a little bit of both, challenge. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's, I think I think it's I think it's I think it's the, the latter really. Um, you know, we we as believers we understand that what people call freedom is not always freedom, um, and that with freedom come responsibilities. We 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 absolutely get that link, and I think that you know what we do in our job kind of impacts on what we be, you know, or what we believe impacts on what we do in our job. Um, and so when I look at freedom, I like the idea. I want the idea of people coming back, being with family, being, I mean, there's, there's, there's members of our, my church community, I've not seen the back of their head for, you know, nearly a year because we're always just doing this Zoom thing. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, yeah. you, you, you're welcoming that and the opportunity to do that without feeling that you're, you're breaking any guidance or, or regulations. But the responsibility bit of me is also kicking in. So anybody who looks at the numbers anybody who follows the figures and you not just me but lots of people follow the figures and, and they're asking very valid questions which is you know our numbers are going up nationally in fact the numbers that we're at are probably equivalent to the numbers that we were using when we decided to to lock down previously so what will that mean uh, and what are the risks even with you know some of the measures we've got in place in relation to social distancing what impact did that have or, vaccinations so we still know that there are people that are now um, going into hospitals still people still getting sick admittedly it's not how it was in those early peaks but what would it mean in the future so with me there's a there's a lot of caution and a lot of being able to just remind people that we're not out of this and we need to do the best we can to continue to operate in as responsible a way as we possibly can mm -hmm. so why do you think the decision has been made to open up? Uh, you know, it's, it's with these things, people will balance stuff, you know? Um, lots of people are very always concerned with what does that mean financially to people, which is, you know, important, business, your economy, that is important, people's mental well-being. Nobody wants to be enclosed into, into an environment. So, you know, these are all valid, valid concerns, but we also need to realize that there have been, I know lots of people who are, have been sick or in, currently with long COVID or people that are no longer with us. And, and yes, people will say, oh, but you know, some of those people would have died anyway. Some may have, but not the proportion that we, we have seen, you know? Uh, and so I'm really, really want to make sure that we don't have to lose one more person than we otherwise would have through some fairly simple preventative kind of actions so it's about people just not going going crazy but i understand that there are other pressures um that have that have led to this kind of opening up that's right because we also have to consider mental health issues um that, that and the natural drive the human drive to connect to be with people, to be together, and which is totally understandable. And I am sure we all miss, I personally, I miss church so much. I miss mm -hmm. singing, <laughs> I miss all of these things. Um, but of course we hope um, that one day this will be over. 
But speaking about this, um, knowing that there are many mutations coming up, we're now at the at the letter delta, um, but we've already heard of a letter lambda coming up uh, elsewhere in the world. So where is this going to lead? Is there an end in sight? Okay, I, I think that one of the things that people kind of need to understand is that when we're talking about changes in virus, viruses, you know, whether it's shifting or drifting, that's what viruses do. That's the, that's the nature of what viruses do. Just like the nature of what people do some things, viruses do another thing. And one thing viruses do is change. That's how they keep going. And, and we, we're used to this because every year, when we do the when we have our flu vaccination or where the flu is circulating it's flu but it's a slightly different flu from the flu that was last year and that's why sometimes your your vaccination from your previous year won't serve you this year we're used to that we live with that well i i think there's something that people think there is something special and unique about you know covid no it's it's a virus and it's going to do that what we're much better at doing now though than we, than we ever used to be, is we're able to spot those changes. So we can do the typing to say, oh, what's moving? What's shifting? What's changing? In a much more responsive way than we had previously. You know, we used to look at what was happening in Australia and then we try and tweak what we did with the virus over here and or prepare people in that way. So, so there's always going to be shifts. The key thing though, is are those drifts or those shifts sufficient to mean that the, the, the protective mechanism that we have, whether it's you know with our, with our vaccination, is it sufficient to say that those don't work anymore? Do they need to change? Do they need to adjust? So I'm really pleased that we see them in the sense that we spot them, as opposed to not spotting them and then have, having no no response to them. It's it's just the way of viruses, and you'll find that with other viruses if people just go and have a have a look around that. So of course we're talking here about a reactive approach with social distancing, with following the measures, uh, with being careful and vigilant, but also we have a proactive approach by creating immunity towards the virus. And of course, we will have to talk about the V word. We have to talk about vaccinations here. And um, we've heard some theories that the vaccination would increase the mutation pressure and would lead to more mutations. But uh, there was a paper recently published that said that actually the opposite is the case, that the more immunity we create through vaccinations, the less likely mutations are going to be. Uh, what is your point of view in this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that that's kind of a, a well, it's well known because viruses are opportunists and they, they the, the more opportunities that they have to circulate, the more opportunities there are for them to change so you know all that selective pressure for them to be able to find a host where it's a little bit different so what you really need to do is cut off the oxygen for them to transmit from place to place to place now the more that we can get that down um the, the less those opportunities are and you know there, there are many many papers and research that's out there that really speak about this we'll always get you know uh, there will be a scientist from somewhere that says it's different. We've always had that. We had the same thing uh, previously with, with, with other childhood vaccinations, where even though the data is very, very clear, you know, people will choose to believe what they choose to believe. And I, I think for me personally, I've, I've given up on the idea of trying to change people's opinions if they've already got a fixed opinion. I just think that that's, that's futile because it, it doesn't matter what I say. Um, then the issue will be with what I have said. But for those who are genuine that want to know more, I, we're always happy to say, look, just have a look at this. Just check it out for, check it out for yourself. Please don't use the likes of social media and you know, all of these different things where people will give you lots and lots of stories. And it, they look very glossy, but they've not been checked. They've not been validated. It will be maybe a single person's opinion and they'll, be call, they'll call themselves a whistleblower. But when you look a little further, it's not quite that. Um, so I always say, look, with everything comes accountability. And if if you've got accountability with the person that's giving you whatever the information is, that's a much stronger position to be in than if somebody's got it wrong, but there's no accountability. You can't go back to them. You can't go back to them on WhatsApp and say, ah, 
you told me not to, and this is what happened, that, you, that, that person's gone. So, so, so look in your, your decision, that your, your de decisions about what you do for places of accountability. Where can you go back to? Where can you ask those questions back? Not just the day that you see it, but into the future. And I'm so happy that you that you mentioned uh, different scientists because I think the beauty of science is actually the scientific consensus. And um, what many people don't understand, I feel, is that um, they feel that there's one theory that is pushed and another theory that is put down. But it is actually not the case because scientific consensus means that many scientists from many different backgrounds around the world are scrutinizing the data, are doing their own research, are really trying to do this and, and verifying it. So it is not just one scientist that says he knows it all, but it's, it is a consensus of many scientists that actually work together for the, the good uh, for all of us. And the scientific method and scrutiny is actually a biblical principle and actually God wants us to scrutinize but he wants us also to use our heads and our brains while we're doing this. Um, so I want to ask you uh, a little bit about the, the reporting system, because when we have different theories coming about different glossy headlines, diff different uh, information that is spreading, they say, well, the government is publishing this, this, uh, this uh, data, we can see that Thousands of people die from vaccinations. We have the reports online. Now, of course, this is a very skewed point of view, but how is it possible that um, this data is available, but is also so misconstrued? Well, I think, I think one of the things that we always want to just keep going forward on is, is transparency. We want to be as open as we possibly can. And I always find it interesting that people almost argue against transparency when, when it's provided. So they say, oh, look, we've looked at this data and this is what this is what it is. Well, I still want to see the data out there. I want it to be transparent. I want for us to know exactly what people have experienced. Uh, uh, and, and I think that should be both ways. You know, sometimes it, it's really funny that people want it to be transparent one way, but they want it to, they want to be secret in, a, in another way. So, so certainly one of the things that we have with any new medicine is that we, you know, we, or, or any medication actually, is we have yellow card systems. We have that if something has gone wrong, somebody says, I, I took this and this is what happened. That shouldn't just sit on its own somewhere. There should be a way of reporting that up. Uh, and that's what we have. We have a, a system where if something's wrong or you have, now the thing is you have to take all of that information against the background of, of, of everything else. So. You know, if you have a situation where you're giving us, we have millions and millions of doses of, 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 of a medication. Um, and in that medication, just as you will have a look with any natural medication even, you, you, you get a reaction. Somebody will have a reaction to it. You want that recorded so that somebody else who may have that condition or may have that, that they know about it. So that's what the system is, it's to be able to identify are there any patterns? Are there any things that we can identify early? Is there any recommendations that we need to change on this so to make sure that no further harm comes to anybody else? But you also have to factor that against the benefit that the thing is doing. You can't just look at one side and say, I've looked at all these harms. Have you also looked at the benefits? Have you looked at how many people are ending up in ITU? Have you looked at how many people are ending up in hospital? Have you looked at how many people have died? Is it making a difference in relation to that? And, and that's the other part of the equation and you are constantly balancing the two. That's, that's it's, it's very good that you're mentioning this actually. Can you give us a little bit of a reality check? What has actually happened? Uh, who has been affected the worst and who is actually right now in danger? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting because I was just looking and then remember there is real, well, there's real stuff. It's not all theoretical. So constantly I'm looking in very practical ways about who's in my, who's in the hospital at the moment? Who's on ITU mm -hmm. uh, at the moment? I want to know that week by week, day by day. Last week, 80% of the people that were on ITU were, were, were unvaccinated, completely unvaccinated. Now, just put that data into your thinking in terms of saying, all right, 
I, I, you know, I might not believe in vaccination. I might not want that. But please bear in mind that that's what we're seeing. You can't just say that it doesn't exist. It exists. So you have to use that in your decision making around what it is that you're going to do. Of course, even with vaccination, none of them are, it's not 100%. You know, I think they've been at pains to sort of talk about, you know, 85 to 90% effective. Still means that there's going to be a proportion that it doesn't work for. It doesn't give you the degree of coverage that you would, as you, as you would, as I said, with any other medication, but it's really high. So it's not enough to sort of say, well, this person was double vaccinated and they ended up in hospital uh, as well. Well, as a proportion of those, how, how often is that? We're just talking about what do you need to protect yourself, to protect your loved ones, what's available to you. And you have to make those choices and you have to make those decisions based on real information that, that you have rather than somebody saying I have heard or I believe or I've got this one paper or these two people that, that say otherwise uh, and and that's 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 difficult but fundamentally it does come down to, to our choices and and it's it's true it is a personal choice we have pl plenty of personal choices every day to make and of course, as a church, we always leave vaccination up to the personal choice of the church members. However, I really think it is important to, to really think about how self-centered human beings are by nature. And it's a normal thing to be self-centered. So when I think about the majority, I automatically think about myself. Now, that is not a majority. That is also not somebody who is vulnerable. So when we think, well, I'm not affected, I don't have any underlying diseases, I'm not vulnerable, why should I adhere to, um, to those uh, social distancing measures? But I have to think at the same time about vulnerable people in terms of I am endangering possibly through the choices I make. And I think it is important to put names and faces on this because let us think of that each church right now has people with underlying diseases. I'm sure each church has a few children with either diabetes or asthma or any other disease who will not be able to attend Sabbath school. We all agree that we want to open the churches mostly also for the children. But if we as the adults do not adhere to the measures, then of course we hinder those children who are the most vulnerable among us to go. And uh, we have to be we have to be so aware of uh, who uh, is affected by our choices, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, if we go into Matthew, of course, at the beginning of Matthew, it says, you know, when Christ is talking, he says, you know, the, 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 all of the commandments, you know, can be can be taken down onto love God and love your fellow men. So whatever you do, examine it through that lens. You know, it might be that you might feel, well, I feel a different way, but if you feel, you should feel, I've got a duty of care. I've got to do all I can to protect others. So it might mean, don't, doesn't matter how much you love Mrs. Smith, you may decide, you know what, I'm not gonna put myself, I'm not gonna go up and do that big hug. I'm not gonna go and do that thing. Cause I know that she's, you know, she's older, she's more vulnerable or whatever. I just need to think about what's what works for her, what's safe for her. What action can I take that helps her if it's not about just helping me? It's a whole different, we've got a different mandate for love that, that comes with who we purport to believe in and, and who we purport to trust. So I think that that's, that's really also part of how we view our, our, our assessments of you know, risk and well-being and, and all of those things. So make sure that your actions or what you do doesn't affect the other. So you might hold your principle and that's that's fine. But I don't think it's fair than that somebody else has to bear that. And I mean, I've, I've heard people saying, well, I'm going to wait for herd immunity. So I'm going to wait until, you know, 80, 90% of the population are vaccinated and that will give us herd immunity and then I don't have to be vaccinated. Well, actually, you're then relying on somebody else. You're asking you're taking from somebody else in order for you to, to benefit from. So I, I, I still don't think that that's, that is a reasonable and a fair position to, to adopt really. Um, so I think that if you do make those decisions, please make sure that nobody else is impacted by that decision. So when we're talking about personal responsibility, 
and duty of care. We're not only talking about what not to do, because I think as Christians, we're very often confronted with, um, oh, your religion is prohibiting you to do, to live your life, to do things. But actually, Christianity and, and Adventism especially is a very active and very proactive uh, faith. So in this context, I think rather than just looking for avoiding uh, things, we should also be active. And I'm, I'm referring here to the term that was coined in, in 2017, actually, um, a, a paper that was published in The Lancet um, by, by Singer and colleagues. And he coined the term of a syndemic. That means that biological and social interactions are important for prognosis and treatment and health policy. So when we talk about a syndemic, that health disparities, that biology, that religion, that different faiths, different ethnicities, they all work together in, uh, in a, a, an image of an illness, then we actually have a whole different point of view of what responsibility means. Because then proactively, if we have the duty of care, we have the duty to help abolish health disparities. We have the duty to actually work against discrimination, to actually actively engage in the communities. Beatrice, that is that that for me is the core of what we do. I have this, I'm in this unique position of being able to have that in what I believe in and actually what I do for a living. The biggest, the biggest thing that's come out of this pandemic for me, it, you know, there was this kind of false narrative that this that somehow this pandemic was the great leveler it wasn't it was the great light that showed the inequalities that we feed in our society that people that were being exposed were the ones that were dying who were already most vulnerable in terms in terms of access to treatment it was the ones that were least able that were, were getting to the treatments first real endemic social inequalities and we as a as a people of faith can't sit and do that. We can't hide in our walls or behind our screens uh, and see social injustice and just let it ride. We know that the Lord is coming and we know that the world will be a different place, but that doesn't negate us of our responsibility to our fellow men today. What do we do now that people are thinking in very, very different ways about their health and well-being? What do we do when people have lost their jobs as, as a result of this? And, and how do we, we help those individuals? What do we do when now we've got groups of volunteers who have started some incredible work over the course of the pandemic, really looking after their neighbors, really paying attention, really thinking about the inequalities that the, the place that they live in looks like. How do we get into that, into that space and into that movement? Because it's exactly where we're meant to be. If anything good comes from this, it will be that it's shone a light to say there is more to life than just me. There's more it to was life. A wake than up just call, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a wake up call for us all, you know. Um, and I and I hope that we will respond to that call uh, and not spend time, you know, dealing with things internally at the time when externally so many people are will be interested in the way that we want to live, the way that the value systems that we say are actually more important than just your economics and your finance. This is, this is a moment for us to really show what it means to be believing Christians. And if we spend that time looking inside to ourselves completely and dealing with our own small arguments and confrontations, we will have missed a, a, an amazing opportunity. That's so right. And it's, it's so important to keep the ball rolling. Now, for my final question, I'm going to ask you the question that I like asking everybody I interview. So um, it's kind of a surprise question. It's called the miracle question. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's, uh, it's a question that was coined in the psychotherapy uh, um, corner over there, but it's, it is very important. So you have a unique point of view as a director for public health. You see, um, a lot of things that other people don't see. Now, here's the miracle question. Imagine you would wake up one day and overnight all the problems that you perceive as problems would have been solved and gone away. What would be the first thing 
that you see when you look out the window that would tell you that the world has changed for the better. So, Beatrice, can you just repeat that last bit? Because my connection is yeah. a bit unstable. So I got to the bit when I woke up and everything was gone. I was really happy to that point. So <laughs> what was the other part? How would, you, how would you notice that everything would have changed for the better? What would be the one thing that would tell you everything is good now? You know, I... I, I, I it, I would know it before I even got to work. I would know it or even on my walk into the office. Very, very simple things about clear demonstrations that people cared about people. You can see that at a traffic light. Who would that, you know, if I suddenly saw people stopping and letting people walk by saying, how are things, how are you this morning? People being genuinely concerned about other people. I'd be like, what? place is this you know yeah. what is going on here where there is a genuine love for your fellow man and I think even at the beginning of the pandemic I saw that I saw some of that where people had not spoken to neighbors but suddenly streets were together and talking about Mrs Jones who lives at number 30 has anybody been to see her can we check do I need to go and get shopping for her do I need to get food for her when we love our brothers more than our, our brothers and sisters more than we love ourselves that would be the great miracle that would be the thing that i feel would show that something has just happened that's so wonderful and i love that answer and thank you so much uh, for making the time today again and i think we're truly blessed um, by your service uh, you're witnessing to the world for, for us, for Christ, and this is so wonderful. And I want to uplift you, I want to, I want to applaud you, I want to uh, thank the Lord for you, and I want to pray for you as well as we close. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, you have blessed Brother Brown uh, with so much knowledge and with so much insight. And thank you that through him, you have blessed us as well. I ask you to continue blessing him and uplifting him as well as all the other health professionals who are working tirelessly and all the carers who are working tirelessly to do your service here. Let us show true care and true love for each other and give us your will and your enthusiasm and your motivation for this. In your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, so you much. very much, Beatrice. And um, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Now,